Brett Cooper is a professional actress turned conservative political commentator. She left woke Hollywood for the Daily Wire, which is located right here in Nashville, where they have relocated very wisely, I might add. She now hosts the comments section. Would you please welcome to our show for the very first time, Brett Cooper. Thank you, Brett. I find your personal story very compelling mm -hmm. because you leaned left through a lot of your early life. And then I don't know if it was an epiphany or if it was sort of a slow mm -hmm. rise to kind of seeing the light and getting involved in a more conservative approach. How did that happen for you? Um, well, I was raised by a libertarian objectivist. My mother studied under Ayn Rand and she mm -hmm. was a textbook publisher for W.W. Norton. So I was actually raised in a very... Uh, freedom, individualistic, valuing family. Okay. Um, so I wasn't terribly, I wasn't very left-leaning, but I, because I started working in Hollywood when I was seven years old, it was my first professional acting job, um, my entire life was left-wing, basically. Yeah. My, every job that I did, every single one of my friends um, was on the left. The work that I did was supporting leftist values, um, and I knew that it was very different than the things that I had been, you know, raised um, supporting and valuing, valuing and trying to live my own life in accordance to. Um, and so it just got to a point where I could no longer work in that industry because I felt like I was compromising everything that I knew. Um, and so when I graduated from UCLA last year, I made the decision that I did not want to pursue uh, a lifelong career in entertainment. I had done it as a child. I was a child actor, somehow made it out alive and with a level head. Um, <laughs> and not a lot of people do. I mean, yes. sometimes people are really ruined by that experience. It's a very, I was talking about this earlier today with a couple of coworkers actually, but it is a very turbulent uh, industry, especially mm -hmm. for the creatives that are involved. You get whipped around a lot. You have no control over, um, and you have no autonomy over really any of the projects that you do, where you go, where you're located. In one day, you could be in Los Angeles, and three days later, they're sending you to Vancouver to film something. At one point, uh, I was doing a season two of a show that I was on that ended up getting canceled, but they were planning on shooting it in Prague. So I was like, okay, my <laughs> life is going to be at 15, uprooted and have to move to Prague. You get no say, really, in it, because if you sign on, then you're in. Um, and you really do get whipped around. You get chewed up and spit out especially if you dissent from any of their narrative. Before you landed at the Daily Wire, you did some work with uh, my dear friend Dennis Prager at yes. PragerU. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the greatest things that's out there in mm -hmm. the public square today. Yes. How big of an influence was Dennis Prager and the experience of mm -hmm. putting videos together with PragerU? It was huge. I joined uh, PragerU's youth organization, or you know, high school and college group, which is called Prager Force, uh, during the middle of COVID because I had been outed as a conservative at UCLA. I, I was asked to leave my sorority. Really? Because, yes, because it was, um, ca it was Kappa Delta, which is Amy Coney Barrett's former sorority. So when she was appointed to the Supreme Court by President Trump, uh, during our rush, we, had, we were given a script, basically, to say we do not agree with Amy Coney Barrett. We understand that our sorority is under a lot of, you know, scrutiny right now. Um, we don't agree. We support, you know, the women's right to choose, like all of this stuff. We don't agree with her. Um, and then we had to sign a petition to have her stripped of her sorority letters, basically. Good heavens. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And people had already started catching on that I wasn't agreeing. And then at the same time, uh, I was sort of slowly outed to the people that I was living with, my college roommates, and got so aggressive, had violent threats against, you know, Trump supporters, other conservatives, saying that they would be fine if they ran over a conservative and they died, that sort of thing. Realized Don't you love the love and right? diversity the tolerance? and tolerance? Yeah, the it's all about it, yeah. Um, and I realized that that was not going to be an environment that I could live in anymore, so I moved back home. My family was in Los Angeles at the time, so I finished up my UCLA academic career you know, living at home during COVID, I felt incredibly isolated. I had, you know, kind of had to remove myself from a lot of social situations because of, you know, politics and COVID. And so I went to PragerU basically begging for, like, some kind of conservative and political home in Los Angeles. Yeah. Because at the time, Daily Wire was about to leave. Breitbart had already moved. Dave Rubin was leaving. And it was just PragerU in Los Angeles. And they took me under their wing. I started making videos for them. Um, you know, got to know Dennis, went on his show a couple of times, um, and they were incredibly instrumental in giving me the confidence and the tools that I needed in order to start speaking out, to have a voice on social media, um, and then started writing articles for the Foundation for Economic Education, 
I joined forces with Young Americans for Liberty and joined their team for a bit, which then, you know, turned into Daily Wire reaching out to me, asking me if I wanted to move here and host a show for them. Tell me, is there hope that other young people, Generation Z, mm -hmm. are going to sort of wake up and see that socialism doesn't work? Are, are we destined to have that generation grow up and just say, everything that we've ever been a part of in America is wrong? I don't think so. Um, I think that there is hope. So my demographics on YouTube, mm -hmm. on my YouTube channel, I think I'm like 38 to 40 percent 18 to 24 is my age range, which is huge. Yeah. Like traditional like YouTube channels, it you know usually stems older, especially in conservative media, it is usually older audiences. So that is a large, large portion of young people. The other thing that is interesting is that when I look at my comments and I look at the demographics of who is watching and subscribing to my channel, a large portion are not conservatives. And they, they comment and they'll DM me and they'll say, you know what, I'm more of a centrist or I'm somebody, I'm a liberal, but the things are kind of confusing and you're providing common sense. Whether or not they are fully coming over to the conservative side, yeah. it's, a, it, it's a lot of people like Joe Rogan and Tulsi Gabbard and Tim Pool um, and these people that are disgruntled liberals, basically, mm -hmm. that, you know, might still have left-leaning, you know, ideas on some things, but they are realizing that that 1%, the very radical, the loud progressive left, that they're insane. Yeah. Um, and are finally seeing, like, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is. They are... <laughs> are in the entire liberal side of this country and the Democrats and especially the politicians are so scared of that 1% because yeah. they are so loud, because they are, in, in, like I said, insane. And they worry that, you know, they're going to destroy their reputation so they have to bend a knee to them. And finally, I think the mainstream public is waking up and realizing, oh, my God, like, what am I subscribing to? This is crazy. Yeah. Like, two-year-olds are changing their gender? Like, no. Yeah. Uh, there was a protest today, or a couple of days ago at Amazon where 30 employees, and now Amazon has thousands of employees, 30 employees did a die-in, which means that they lay down in public and pretend to be dead because Amazon is still selling transphobic books, one of which is Irreversible Damage, and another one is Johnny the Walrus, which is Matt Walsh's children's book. Runaway bestseller. Yes, incredible. Yeah. And I think it's back up to the number one bestseller in, like, comedy and political yeah. satire. And they are so angry that they are still selling, that they're selling these books, but it was 30 employees out of thousands. And if you look at the comments on all of the pictures of this protest, these are left-wing reporters covering this. Yeah. Everybody in the comments is going, these people are insane. And like banning books on any side of the political aisle is wrong. And that why gives me hope, Brad. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you, it's a great way for us to conclude, just to, mm -hmm. to, to let you tell us mm -hmm. that there is hope that yeah. there is a light at the end of this tunnel and it is not a train mm -hmm. and we can be happy about what <laughs> yeah. may be ahead. I, I so, I'm so glad you're there. Your voice is so important. I hope people will uh, be able to find you. Uh, you can do that if you head over to Huckabee.tv. We have a connection to The Daily Wire, Brett Show, the comments section with Brett Cooper. We also have links to keep up with uh, Brett on social media, which I think you will find very enlightening and entertaining.